Thank you, Sonny. Okay, so how is everyone else doing with that link? Is everybody else logged into the, the teaching session of Looker? Uh, this is Jason. I am logged in. I am. All right, well, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Welcome to the Looker Developer Bootcamp. This is a training for LookML developers, people who need to write the supporting code for business users to explore data. We will cover foundational LookML features and syntax to create and maintain your data models. My name is Danny. I am a senior BI engineer at Mavenwave based in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been using Looker for 15 months now. Um, yeah, since we're all gonna be in a room together um, for the next several hours, um, would, could we please go around the room and introduce ourselves? Sure, I will start. This is Carrie Kasten. Um, I work for um, Enterprise Claims, and I have no experience with Looker. Um, I'm a business analytics analyst um, with the data analytics and reporting team, and we're just here to get more info on building data models in Looker. Great. I'll go next. I'm Bindu, uh, same as Carrie. We, I work for the Enterprise Claims Data Analytics team. I have no experience with Looker either. Looking forward to learn. I can go next. I'm Jack Maastricht, and same as Bindu and Carrie. I work for Enterprise Claims Data uh, and Analytics. I also have no experience with Looker. Um, but I'm hoping to learn a little bit today and um, kind of learn what the software is about. Great. I can go next. This is Jason Adjualski. I'm with Connect. I'm the information architect. Uh, so I'm in one of the operating companies, so one of the spokes. Um, and I was fortunate to have the opportunity to be part of the initial POC. So I have some familiarity, um, but I'm looking forward to learning a whole lot more. I guess I'm Trish. You guys met me before because I'm struggling with getting into the uh, training session, but um, I work on the BWS uh, team for uh, DTR services, and we're very interested in using Looker um, and integrating it with our Google Cloud Platform data solutions. I'm also brand new to Looker. Great. Is there anyone Mansi, else from it? Go ahead. Um, sorry. <laughs> Mansi here. I am uh, managing this project on the Anthem side. And um, I am also a data and BI person, have been for like eight years. So um, come from a Tableau background, new to Looker, just like most of us here, and looking for a way to navigate through Looker, learn the basics of how to learn more by ourselves on Looker. <laughs> and uh, be able to support our business units in their reporting needs. Thank you. I'm Matt on the same team as Carrie, Bindu, and Jack. I also have no experience with Looker and just looking to learn more.
Hi, this is Navjot. Uh, I'm uh, from uh, Enterprise Data Office uh, from Amazon side. I have experience with Tableau and other reporting tools, so I'm really new to GCP and looking forward to learn more about it. Hi, uh, I'm Sai, and uh, I'm seen as uh, Navjot and Mansi's team. So I'm a data solution engineer. So I have other experiences with uh, BI tools like Tableau, Power BI, and also an overview of Looker and LookML. So I just wanted to learn more about like, creating the dashboards and work with Looker. Exactly. Hi, this is uh, Shubhi. I am also from Enterprise KPI development team and uh, coming from BI and data background. I uh, have worked with Tableau and other BI tools before and I have uh, worked a little with Looker as well. So looking forward to enhance my skills on Looker. Great. Hi, this is Akshaya here. I work for the Enterprise BI Analytics team as well, and I have experience with Tableau and Power BI. And recently, I had an opportunity to do the Looker training. I'm looking forward to knowing more about it. Fantastic. Uh, hi, I'm, this is Jarong. And I'm also from MFAM BI analytics teams. So I actually don't have much experience with Looker, but I have experience with like Power BI. Uh, so happy to see you guys here. I'm Samantha. I'm with the general data analytics team. Um, we did the first. Um, POC for Looker, so I'm looking forward to getting into it again. I'm Maddie. I'm also with uh, the general data analytics team with Sam. Um, I got to see a little bit in the POC as well and enjoyed that, so excited to learn more. I'm Stan Smith, um, Enterprise BI Analytics Manager. A um, number of folks on this call looking to learn more, which is great. Um, my true desire out of this session is to help understand how best to roll this, this tool out at scale across the org, uh, learn some things here, make some documentation available. So as we grow the footprint across the organization, we have a good way to enable folks to get on board. Uh, so looking to learn a ton and you know, looking forward to see what you guys can teach me. Anyone else from Amfam? Okay, well, let's get started. So, uh, for the agenda, um, we're doing this uh, in three days, maybe four, if we uh, if we need the time. But you know, originally this is broken into two two days. But um, to talk about the agenda, we're going to first start with an introduction to LookML, its key terminology, and where and how to write code. Then we will practice writing dimensions and measures, which are fields that business users will need for analytics. We'll examine model files and practice building and filtering explorers. In day two, we'll learn about caching in Looker and how to define our own caching policies called data groups. We'll develop derived tables, which are functionally similar to materialized views to customize data structures that don't exist in the, in the database. We'll do a brief overview of key administrative topics, focusing on ones that directly impact LookML development. And finally, we will wrap up with best practices and a summary of everything covered in this training. LookML stands for Looker Modeling Language. It is Looker's proprietary language that provides an abstraction layer for SQL databases. Looker is a browser-based software-as-a-service platform that connects to any SQL database. They say today, every company is a data company. Organizations collect and store data on any number of things from any number of applications. For instance, software-as-a-service apps such as Salesforce, MailChimp, and Zendesk. 
heavy write read write operations in transactional databases such as Oracle, IBM DB2, and Microsoft SQL Server. There's business planning tools such as SAP, NetSuite, and Oracle, and there's web analytics project, products such as Google Analytics and Adobe Analytics. These are just a few examples. Again, any data stored in any SQL database can be supported in Looker. Looker's agile modeling layer allows developers to explain through LookML models how the database is structured, how the tables and columns relate to each other. Looker takes this information, and as a business user, users explore and analyze the data, Looker constructs SQL selects queries to send to the database. The results can be surfaced through the web interface in the form of explorers, dashboards, and looks, through scheduled data deliveries such as emails, through explorers, dashboards, and looks that are embedded into other websites and applications, and through a REST API, which allows you to retrieve, analyze, and transform data and metadata from, from the Looker platform. One major benefit of this agile modeling layer is that it saves data teams and business analysts a ton of time that would otherwise be spent manually writing and editing SQL queries. The other is data governments, governance, meaning we can define a single source of truth where everyone in the business understands and trusts the data they see in front of them. So um, just for a, you know, a rough overview of what you know, the, the end state of, of Looker is, um, it's a data visualization tool. And this is an example called the Business Pulse Dashboard. At the top, you see KPIs, um, you know, new users acquired, average order sale price. And then we have some, uh, you know, some secondary KPIs underneath it. Um, then we have a, a, a stacked, uh, area chart, uh, orders by day and category, um, total revenue by year, uh, uh, by location. So, um, you know, Looker can, you know, do, you know, all the basics of any data visualization tool. Um, you also, you know, this is a really nice, um, feature of, of lookers you know if you're if you're a business analyst viewing this dashboard you can actually you know drill into a dashboard and, and really see what's underneath the hood um, this is called um, the looker explore feature uh, this is kind of where you you build visualizations that you then send to dashboards so yeah this is um, a hypothetical uh, e-commerce e store. So, um, you know, uh, let me tell you something that probably was the most important thing that my manager told me when I uh, started working here at Maven Wave about 16 months ago. Um, he told me that in any data visualization tool, there are four key iterative steps that go into the process of any data visualization tool. Number one is connect to data. Number two is wrangle data. Number three is visualize data. And number four is surface data. So if you think of all of the data visualization tools that you you've used from Tableau to Power BI to now Looker, um, you know, anytime you go into them, I think it's 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 really helped me just to break down the tool into those four quadrants and just really focus on, you know, those are the four steps of of any data viz tool and just um, thinking like that is you know, makes it a lot less daunting. So step one is connecting to data. If you're completely new to the development side of Looker, there's a fundamental prerequisite to be aware of. A Looker administrator needs to connect a data source. They would work with a data engineer or data administrator to create a database user for the Looker platform to use. 
Then they would go to the connections page in the admin panel to set up the connection. Different database dialects, such as Amazon Redshift versus Google BigQuery, may have different configuration requirements. Here we see Redshift requires the host, port, and database name. If we were connecting a BigQuery data warehouse, we would need to provide the project and data set, and we could choose to use OAuth or upload a JSON file with service ac account credentials. The link docs page leads to more detailed documentation on setup and configuration. As LocalML developers, we can see available database connections by opening the developer tab in the top navigation bar and selecting SQL Runner. Let me show you that. So, um, you know, when it comes to Looker, um, the most important thing that I think you should know is uh, there's no ETL layer to Looker. Uh, Look, Looker never, you know, takes the data from your database and moves it into its own data environment, much like you get with, uh, you know, Tableau and Power BI. Instead, you know, Looker pretty much attaches itself inside of every database that it connects to. And all it does is it just writes SQL, SQL queries against your database. And then uh, the results that get returned to the SQL database is what gets visualized in Looker. So, you know, it's really important to understand that there really is no data movement in Looker. And Looker is really known for data governance. And I think about, you know, why is it, so great with data governance. I think a big reason is because there is no ETL layer. You know, the data is always going to live inside your database and you don't have to worry about it, you know, creeping out elsewhere. And, you know, this is the SQL runner, which um, basically, you know, you can write any code uh, just like you would in any database, you know, in this later, in this layer. And it just gives a gist of, you know, that's all that Looker does is just LookML is a, is a semantic layer that writes SQL code in every database dialect. So, you know, LookML knows all the nuances of every database and it's SQL and it, you know, tailors all of the code that it writes based on the database that it's connecting to. So let's define some key LookML terms. LookML is a language for describing dimensions, aggregates, calculations, and data relationships in a SQL database. Looker uses a model written in LookML to construct SQL queries against a particular database. It creates the layer between that SQL database and how the end user gets to interact with it. As such, it defines lots of different things, like how to join tables, how to define custom tables, how to define fields from the database, and the logic for new fields. Let's start with the lowest level of LookML objects, which are fields. Dimensions are created for any column that already exists in the database table. We can also create additional dimensions that would serve as logical representations of table columns. These show up in the select statement and group by clause of the SQL statement. They are the attributes that describe your data. Measures, on the other hand, are aggregates, which don't live physically in your database table. They need to be created. They aggregate dimensions together like sums or counts. Note that they do not appear in the group by, they depend on dimensions to determine that grouping. Views are where we define dimensions and measures. Think of these as tables that bundle related fields. There are a few different types of views. 
the one that you'll be working with mostly are standard views, which abstract what's already in your database table. Next, there are virtual tables known as derived tables, which we'll cover later in this training. The last is persistent derived tables, which are derived tables written back to the underlying database. We'll also talk about that in day two. Views are the building blocks of explorers. Explorers are the drivers of analysis on the front end. They include one or more views to link, join together, and each usually targets a specific business question. If it helps, think of an explorer as a predefined set of tables that would frequently need to be joined for business inquiries and use cases. Models are the next level of the hierarchy, which contain which database connection we are using as defined here in line one, which view files are accessible in this model as defined in line two, and the explore definitions and their join logic. This is also the level at which we de designate user access. Can a user access this group of explorers in this connection is what we're asking. The highest level of LookML is a project. A project is essentially a library of code that typically maps one-to-one -to, -one to a data source or database connection. You can think of each project as an almost independent mini instance or microcosm of Looker. Schemas that cannot be joined together usually reside in different projects as there is no relation to be made across the two data sets. This depends on your database dialect and database user permissions. A key concept to keep in mind is, if it's possible in your SQL dialect, it should be possible in Looker. If you can go to your database console and handwrite a select statement that does a thing, you can also code LookML such that Looker does the same thing. Each project maps one-to-one -to, -one to a Git repository. We'll discuss Git in a further detail later. It is possible to share content from one project to another via a feature called Project Import which is what we will be doing for the hub and spoke model that we will implement together. This is an advanced approach to setting up your Looker architecture and it is not in the scope of this training. So to summarize, you know, the past six or seven slides, I was talking about the hierarchy of LookML objects. So, um, you know, the first thing you need to know is a view file. A view is just the tables in the database that you're connecting to. So one table to one view. And inside that view, there's dimensions and measures. Next is explores, which is uh, a conglomerate of SQL view or of views that join the views together. You know, usually when you have a star schema data model, and explore is what's gonna bring everything together. And then uh, the next level is models, which can be many explorers. And then the last is project. And that is you know, the, the root level, uh, the main level. That's where you, uh, you, you schedule your Git repository. So just to summarize, in Looker we have projects which are libraries of LookML code. Since Looker uses Git for version control, each project should map one-to-one -one with a Git repository. A project is comprised of one or more models. A model is a set of explorers by business area or need. For example, you might create a model of various explorers pertaining to customer support. Each model contains one or more explorers. An explore is a set of pre-joined views for business user analysis. A view in Looker is a database table or a logical representation of one. Each view includes dimensions, which are database columns or logical representations of them, and measures, which are aggregate functions on dimensions, such as count of customers or the sum of cost. 
I will show you how it looks when someone creates a look and melt project. In real life, most people do not need to do this on their own, since each data source should be modeled to one project, and most organizations only have a few data sources, the entire developer team would likely only work in a few projects. It's not as if every individual LookML developer needs their own project. So if you're in your own Looker instance, you probably already have in place the projects that you should be collaborating on. Remember, a project is a library of code that models a data source. Projects have three main types of files. Model files, which define the explorers that should be packaged together and how those explorers work. View files, which describe database tables or logical representations of them. And dashboard files, which are less commonly used. You can define dashboards in LookML to prevent business users from editing them. You can maintain version control and sync them across Looker instances if your company has more than one. LookML dashboards are not in the scope of this training. There are other types of project files, such as dimensions and manifests, which are also not in the scope of this training. To create your own project, you would need a permission called Manage Models, which you may not have in your own company's Looker instance. Again, not all LookML developers need the ability to create project. It's something that a team lead or admin would typically do for you. So the developer tab in, in the Looker instance shows a list of projects that already exist in your instance. I can click on Manage LookML Projects to edit their configurations, and I can create a new one by clicking on New LookML L Project up here. So I can go to Manage LookML Projects. This is I'm, I'm showing you how you create a new project. So um, let's say that you know an admin had us connected to a data source. That's step one. Step two is create a project off that data source. So let's do new LookML project. Let's call it bootcamp demo. Any um, starting point, um, just I, I usually keep this one generate model from database schema. Next, you got to uh, click the connection that you want to uh, connect this project off of. Um, do you want to build views off of all the tables and single tables? The easiest is do all tables. Uh, and then uh, schemas and prefixes, we can ignore that. So if I create project, what it does right, you know, right after creating a project is it takes me into the IDE or um, you know the the place where the LookML exists, and you notice that um, there's two types of files. There's model files and there's view files. We'll first talk about the view files. So, I told when I created this project, I told uh, Looker to build a view off of every table that exists in in the in the schema or or data set um, of this connection. And as you can see, there's about uh, 10 different tables that exist in this data. So if I go into any one, um, order items is the main one. It went through every field in this table and it created a dimension off of it. And it does a lot of cool things. Sometimes um, it can figure out the primary key of a table, which it does here. It knows that ID, figuring out that it's the unique indicator of this table, so it marks it as primary key. This is very important, and we're gonna talk about it later. For any uh, date or time field, it's creating a dimension group, so you can slice and dice the data by month, week, uh, a, a bunch of different uh, ways. Um, and it even, uh, you know, this is a measure sale price. Um, it even creates a dimension off of measures or not measures, that you wouldn't call this a measure, you'd call this um, a metric. Um, 
it's usually not necessary to you know see a see a metric as a dimension what you do usually is create measures off of metrics such as the sum of sale price or the average sale price so yeah so um you know look looker already creates all this code for you automatically um and these are you know for every view file for every table that exists in the database it's creating dimensions off of every column and then the next level of, of extraction in looker is the model file and the model file uh, first of all consists of, of the connection and includes all the views so it just calls all these views and then the main thing about models is the model file is it, it, it contains explorers and explorers are the you know are the is the pre-joined um, tables that allow you to you know analyze the data in the next step in the explore tab which i can show you but yeah this is uh you know what it looks like when you create a project looker tries to do a lot of things such as it's already creating all these joins it's figured out that some of these uh you know joins already exist in the in the data model however you know looker could be mo it could be wrong so it is important to you know really verify everything that looker is doing um automatically after you create a project So we just demonst demonstrated how to create a project in Looker. For, the, for today's training, we are using a pre-existing project called Data Analysis Bootcamp. So I will switch over to that. Again, this interface is called the Looker IDE. Let me show you. So yeah, this is known as the Looker IDE. Um, um, I want um, each of you guys to um, to find your own instance of this project of the Data Analysis Bootcamp. The way you do that is you you, you know in the in the top you go to Develop and and you go into the the Data Analyst Bootcamp project. So can can you all please um, you know do that on your own right now? If, and let me know if you guys all have that. Yep. How are we all doing with that? Danny, I see two two data uh, analyst bootcamp files in develop. There's one, and then there's one, and then there's another that has like a dash ja on the end. Yeah, uh, don't do the dash ja. Do the one without the dash ja. Data analyst bootcamp. Okay, thank you. Okay, so you know once you're in that, um, the next thing I want you to do which you know is really taking advantage of you know looker's cloud based functionality is to open up a new tab go into that same looker instance and uh, go down to explore find um, data analyst bootcamp and uh, it might not say exactly order an item explore for you but um, try to get inside the, the order and items explore does that uh, make sense to you guys so just pull up another window and display what you're seeing here pull up an, um, another window and then uh, go into explore find data analyst boot camp and go into the order and items explore 
I just get into this. Items, not the explorer. Can you say that again, please? I'm just able to view order items under the data analyst bootcamp category. We just have one thing that is order items. Hmm. Can you show your screen once more? Could you uh, please mute yourself, Sai? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we're all um, there. So, yeah, during this uh, boot camp, I'm gonna be bouncing around between these two views. This is the IDE, this is the LookML view, the project view, and then- Danny, can you show your screen? I don't think I'm seeing oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, my, my apologies. No worries. I just wanna make sure my screen looks like yours. Okay, so yeah, during this bootcamp, I'm gonna be bouncing around between two uh, tabs that I have open up, the one, is is the lookml which is uh you know the ide this is the project this is where we're going to write code and then the next step just to test all the code that we're going to write we're going to explore it using the explore view this is you know the the next step right after um after lookml is is exploring the data and then right after exploring data is building visualizations for a dashboard um, you know, for this boot camp, um, I would say for probably most of you guys, you know, if you're a data engineer, you know, the product that we're trying to build in Looker is our explorers. We're, we're, we're going to try to build these really great explorers that allow, you know, the future analysts to, to really understand and, and, you know, visualize, you know, your, your data. So there's a lot you can do, you know, to, you really want to, you know, I, I find that, you know, this explore window is very, very powerful for anybody who's really data savvy, savvy and they just want to slice and dice data any way they want. Um, what makes it so nice is it's kind of, you know, similar to a pivot table functionality that you would get in Excel. Um, you can just, you know, it's just click, you can just click to make um, the, you know, the aggregate table that you want. So in this situation, I'm just doing total sales by age. Um, I can then visualize the data to see what it looks like uh, visually, um, you know, showing it in a bar chart like that. And then what's really cool that you need to understand about Looker is, you know, as it's building this aggregate view uh, total sales by age what it's doing in the background is it's just it's just writing a sql statement to your database and this is the exact sql statement that it's writing and um, it's it's the way i would have wrote it if if i wrote it in sql it um, it first joins in the root table which is very important we'll talk about that later it joins in the users table. That's where we're getting the user's age. Um, so, you know, LookML, all it does, all it is, it's an abstraction layer that builds SQL for your database, you know, to, to read. And, you know, as you're in this Explore tab, you know, when you build out Explorers and when you play with it, all that it's doing in the background is just writing SQL code that sends to your database. So I said before, you know, like data is really never moving out of your database. All that Looker does is just 
you know, in every instance, it just sends SQL statements to your database. And then your database just sends the results of the SQL statement to Looker. So it's a very safe, you know, data movement process, very efficient. So there are two different modes. There's production mode and dev mode. In Looker, business users experience the instance in production mode, while developers make changes and add new features through development mode. Production mode is the production version of Looker. Everyone uses a Looker instance in production mode, accesses its projects, explores, and content in the same state. Project files are read only in this mode. Development mode allows you to make changes to projects without affecting anyone else. This mode accesses a completely separate version of your project files that only you can see and edit. If you are familiar with Git, development mode uses a separate branch, while production mo mode uses a main branch. I like to call this a parallel universe of code and Looker experience. So if you compare my project right now to your project right now, you're probably going to see that mine has all this extra code while yours doesn't. Even though this is the same project, you and I respectively are all, we're all working off our own individual branch of this project, which is not ver the production version of this project. It's just the personal dev branch. And that's a really nice facet of Looker, this dev prod dichotomy and the ability to um, develop in a, in a private universe um, of your own and and then along with with github you know which pretty much allows this ability um, it's a very safe and collaborative uh, type of uh, environment and and uh, i really really like that about looker you know, the, the big, uh, what, what's really nice about Looker, making it different than Tableau and Power BI is that it's, you can have multiple people working on the same project at one time, um, and GitHub's gonna manage all that for you, all the, all the crisscross, you know, collaborative differences between your code, you know, GitHub will, will allow that, so, you can't really do that in, in Tableau and Power BI. You can't you can't have two people working on the same in, instance of a project and you know it working in sync. So you know for, for when it comes to really big projects like like we're going to stand up uh, very soon, um, this 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 dev prod uh, environment dichotomy is, is a really nice feature of Looker. Hey, Dan, hey Danny, we have a question from um, Carrie. Yeah, I'm is not, it? Go ahead. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to ask her if you'll cover security later. Um, like I'm wondering how security would work with Looker if we were bringing it in from GCP. You know, like would it have the same security functions or is that handled totally different? Um, it. I guess you have uh, two options. You can use OAuth or, or, or not OAuth. With OAuth, you got this really nice synchronicity uh, between, you know, Looker and your G Suite account, and and you know things, permissions and stuff really flow really nicely. Um, that's the more advanced, more in sync method. And the other option is uh, just without OAuth. And um, yeah, we're not really going to talk too much about security in this session, but um, that is something that I can go more in depth over um, if we need to, you know, in the future. Okay, thank you. In development mode, you can see the effects of your changes to project files in the explorers and content. Once you're happy with your changes, you can save and merge them to production where they are then viewable by everyone. 
dev mode is or development mode is frequently referred to as dev mode. Developers can switch development mode on and off by clicking the development mode on off toggle within the developer menu in Looker. There's also a keyboard shortcut, control shift D. The IDE and Explore menus offer a very a few different features and options in prop versus dev mode. And depending on your permissions and local code differences, you may even see different lists of projects, project files, and explorers. I've mentioned the term IDE a few times now. This is the industry term for any application in which software engineers or developers would write their code, such as Eclipse or Visual Studio. Looker has its own IDE in which we would write LookML. I encourage you to open up the Data Analyst Bootcamp project right now so you can follow along inside the IDE. So on the far left, we can see five nav navigation options. The first one, the folder icon, is the file browser. This displays all the LookML project files in the project in the folder hierarchy. We are working with a pretty basic project in this training. More complex deployments could see dozens or even hundreds of files within many folders and levels of subfolders. At your company, with your own development team, you can decide on any kind of folder structure that would be most intuitive for you. So yeah, please uh, follow along with me. Um, what I'm showing you are these five different panels. These are, we're, we're gonna talk about those right now. What I just mentioned was the file browser. This is the main one. This is what you're gonna be using most. Uh, it, re it breaks down the project into model files and view files mostly. There are other types of files. The other most common one is called a manifest file, but um, that's the first one. The second page represented by a co compass icon is the object browser. The object browser organizes project files by LookML objects in the project. Each model can be expanded to show the explorers within. Each explorer can be expanded to reveal the views, the views that are joined together. And each view can be expanded to explain the dimensions and measures. This is really useful when you need to hunt down a specific field or view being used within the explorer. And if you have many similarly named objects in the model, this really comes in handy. You may also need to visualize, in a sense, and how many explores the same view is being used or which models have the same or similar explores. So um, this, this second, uh, the object browser is very nice when it comes to you know, searching for something. So you know, for instance, if I just type in sales, it's gonna tell me all of the instance where sales exists. And let's say I'm looking for average sales. I just click on average sales and it takes me exactly to the code, where is the code? There it is. Yeah, it takes me directly to um, where it is in the code. Which, when 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 Looker cr creates a project for you the auto-generated dimensions are in alphabetical order, but as you add new measures and dimensions to the view file, you don't have to worry about keeping it in alphabetical order. You can put it any way you want and just rely on the object browser to find exactly what you're looking for. So my advice is don't worry too much about the order of of your LookML code and and how clean it is, um, you can rely on your object browser, and that helps you uh, find things.
Next is the find and replace in pro project feature. You can search for a term like count and see where and how many times this term appears throughout all the files in your entire project. You can also batch replace all instances of a text stream with something else. So yeah, this is like your control H, um, the find and replace. If you ever need to you know, change something across the entire project, a, a name, you can do that. So this is a very nice feature. The fourth page in the IDE is Git Actions. This allows you to switch branches, view past commits by yourself and fellow developers, view the project on GitHub or whatever Git provider you use at your company and more. So yeah, this is the GitHub layer. Um, you don't usually need to go in this tab. Uh, the GitHub, even if you're new to GitHub, uh, there isn't too much about GitHub that you really need to know. It's very easy. It's all a matter of just clicking this button and it navigates you to, uh, you know, what you need to do. But yeah, this is the, the, the Git repository. Sometimes when you do have a Git problem, you do need to go into this area just to diagnose what's going on and, and uh, to fix problems. If we don't yeah. have those bottom two buttons, is that just like a security setting that we can work out? Like I only have the top three. Oh, really? Yeah, I assume that is security. That's just security okay. then. Same here. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so if we turn on the development mode, then only I can see the bottom two. Oh, OK. So if you're not on dev mode, then you can, can't can see them. OK. So the last icon is the project settings page. This is where we would set up what is or isn't required to commit code. Enable pull requests if your team prefers to do code reviews before deploying to production. You can change the Git connection and much more. Although we can see the configurations, only an admin can change uh, the configurations in here. So yeah, this is just project level information. You can delete the project if you need to. You can change uh, the, the GitHub uh, connection which I've done a couple times. So when it comes to branch commit, what is all this? Um, you know, how familiar are you guys with Git in, in general? You guys at AmFam. We use it at AmFam to get stuff in production. At least our team does. OK. We do not use it at Connect yet. We use other um, other software management tools. OK. But we are moving towards it. Yeah, I was new to Git once, you know, 15 months ago when I was first introduced to Looker. I, I wasn't used to uh, this, you know, new software development uh, wave that's coming. But yeah, I really, I really enjoy the tool. Git is not something Looker invented, but rather it is a version control system for multiple programmers to collaborate on the same library of code. Looker integrates with Git for version control of LookML projects. You are able to test changes, save work, and collaborate with other developers via Looker's IDE. LookML is always written in one branch or another. Think of the overall LookML project or Git repository as a tree. The main production code would be the trunk, while each developer would branch off the trunk to make new features such as fields and explorers. You would commonly use Git through a third-party provider such as GitHub, Bitbucket, or GitLab. If using GitHub, for example, this is the format of the repository URL you would need to enter in the Looker IDE when setting up Git. After clicking Continue, Looker would provide a deploy key that you would need to copy paste into the settings of your GitHub repo. Make sure to allow write access in GitHub. This allows Looker to handshake with GitHub and sync changes. 
you only need to set up Git once per project. This is another thing that just gets done once at the very beginning by a team lead or admin. So yeah, if you need help setting up uh, GitHub, it's um, not difficult at all. Let me. Let me show you just how to set up GitHub. I don't think I can set up GitHub in this uh, boot camp. Unfortunately, I was going to try to do it in in my own personal, you know, MavenWave uh, Looker account, but um, that wasn't loading. So we'll just skip it. Um, you know, it's very simple to set up GitHub between, you know, Looker and, and your project. You just need to, you know, log into your, into your GitHub, for example, and create a new repository. And then it just walks you through directions. It's very self-explanatory. And there are some very nice Looker documentation. That's another thing I want to mention to you. Um, another thing I really like about Looker is, is just how, how nice its documentation is. Um, you know, just using Google to, you know, search for, for key Looker terms. Looker usually has a nice documentation pretty much around everything, every term in Looker. So um, it's really, it, it, you know, you're not, you're not left in, in a desert uh, to, to feed for yourself. There's a lot of uh, help that comes from uh, Looker and Google when it comes to documentation. So as you write code, the button in the top right corner of the IDE always tells you the next step to do. Uh, we're talking about um, this 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 button at the, in the in the top right, and it, the flow of this button is it's it's a four level flow. It's save, validate, commit, merge, and deploy. So those are the four times you need to like when it comes to you know using Git, you're gonna you're gonna save and validate your code very often. I do it you know as soon as I make a change to anything, and then if you want to actually move something to production which you don't have to do too often unless you're working you know, on a collaborative project where you guys are both in it at the same time. Um, but I go to, so if I go to my Looker instance right now, I can validate the code and then that was step two. Step three would be to commit and push changes. I'm not going to do that commit or push changes just because um, I want us all working in our own individual instance. So um, I'm just going to leave it hanging on, you know, keeping my personal branch as is. And I'm going to, my, my, my Explorer is, is filled out with all these code. I'm actually going to give you guys a lot of code during this boot camp so that we can, you know, step by step build out uh, our LookML. So if you're not, if you're very new to Git, you don't really have to worry about learning a ton of new stuff. You can almost simply just follow this this button and, and it will navigate you to what you need to do. This, so it's just, a, you know, clicking one button uh, four times. Um, that's what really all it is. Whenever you add, edit, or remove lines of code in a LookML file, 
a blue dot shows up next to the file name in the file browser. So it is easy for you to see when you are making changes. So let me show you that. So if I go into the orders, if I do anything, let me just hit enter. You see that save changes button just popped up. Um, when it comes to any change you make, you, you, you know, right after you make the change, you do want to save and then you want to validate, make sure that uh, LookML accepts, uh, you know, all the code that you wrote. And that's all you need to do. You don't need to take it to the next level. You just need to save and validate. And the good news is, you know, after just those two steps, you can work in your Explorer. Excuse me. And this is also in development mode, and it's going to pick up every change that you made in here and into the IDE. You just got to refresh the browser, and and now you're you're working off of exactly what you changed uh, in in this view. So a good rule of thumb when developing is to pull any changes from other developers before beginning any of your own. So when you go into development mode, immediately pull in those changes. From there, making any changes to look them out as you please, saving and committing as needed. When you click validate look ML, the look ML validator runs to check your syntax. If you get errors and warnings, you should or may have to resolve them before you're allowed to proceed to the next step of the Git workflow. After validating your code, the next step in the Git workflow is commit changes and push. This pushes all of your saved validated changes to a staging, staging area. It is best practice to add a brief comment explaining what to, the commit entails. Try to commit whenever you've completed a reasonable unit of work. What's reasonable means will vary widely based on how many other LookML developers there are and whether you're working on overlapping features. After committing, you can merge and deploy to prod. This makes the changes go live so business users who are always experiencing Looker in production mode, remember that, they will see the changes immediately. Sometimes you may not get this option and may instead see a merge conflict. Conflict. This means another developer recently committing, committed some, change, some code that conflicts with yours. Perhaps you both tried to edit line 10 of the same view file. Any files containing merge conflicts will be displayed in red so you can spot them easily. You will see both your code and the other developers. You will then need to choose which version to keep and commit again in order to reach the next step of merge and deploy. Once you have successfully deployed to production, when other developers toggle on their development mode, they will see the prompt to pull from production. This will enable them to pull in the changes that you have deployed. Many organizations experienced in Git workflows prefer not to let developers go ahead and deploy changes left and right. Instead, they want another pair of eyes on the code, doing a code review. We can support this kind of workflow in Looker using pull requests. In the project settings, a Looker admin can configure the project to enforce either the pull request recommended or pull request required option. When pull requests are enabled, developers can no longer merge and deploy to prod themselves after making commits. Instead, a colleague will need to review the pull request in the Git provider itself and merge the change there upon approval. Each developer would work on their own personal branch or parallel universe. No one else can modify your personal branch, though they could switch it or switch to it or view it, or you could view theirs. 
We can also create shared branches, also known as feature branches. You might want to do this if you are partly through a large workload or epic on your own branch, and you need to develop and deploy an unrelated hotfix without deploying all your other code. Shared branches are also for multiple developers to collaborate on the same version of code. This is useful if you need to work together on a new future feature or bug fix. Often, people would create a new shared branch for each ticket or JIRA issue and then delete the branch when they complete the unit of work. We've talked about how LookML abstracts SQL so that Looker can understand how your underlying database is structured and how it can generate meaningful SQL queries for it. How does the SQL query generate work? So dimensions and measures are the columns that would follow the word select at the start of the query. Dimensions always get grouped while measures are aggregate functions such as count, sum, and average. The base view of the explorer, which is the view name following the word explorer, is always part of the explore query. So even if someone is in the order items explorer looking for the count of users by user state, not selecting or filtering by anything in order items, Looker still selects from order items first and then joins to users. Let me show you this. So what we're saying is, you know, this is uh, the code for a single explorer. It's called order items. This, this piece of code right here is very important. It's telling you what the root table or view is of this explorer. Uh, it's the same name as, as you see as this view file, so it's order items. And then down below, these are all the joins. These are, I'm joining in a user's table, inventory items, product distribution. I think you guys should all see this in your environment as well. Now, when you're working in, in the Explorer, uh, let's say for instance, I don't want to look at anything from the order and items view, but just stuff from the um, from the users table. So I'm looking at uh, the number of users by age. These two columns are in the users table. So I'm doing nothing with the order and items um, view. However, if you look at the SQL, you're going to notice that it's still the first, the first table that it is the from clause is always order items. So it's it's really important to know that you know when it comes to explorers, it, there's a there's a base view, which is uh, the first view, and then what, and, and then everything that's going to be joined to that view. So I mean I like to think of a, a star schema. You know most most data models are uh, are star schema. Uh, this one I I would assume it certainly. It looks like a, a star schema where, you know, we're joining all these views into a root table, the order items table, um, by one key field. So this is a star schema. But it's always this this when it comes to the SQL that gets written, because uh, this is the root table, it's always going to be a part of the query. It's always going to, you know, do that join. Um, there's always going to be a, uh, the root table involved. When a business user adds a filter on a dimension, such as user country equals USA, this adder or modifies the where clause. When one adds a filter on a measure, such as order item count is greater than five, this adds a having clause. If someone says, I only want to see the top 10 states with the most users and sets the row limit accordingly to 10, this affects the limit clause. Looker should always be generated valid SQL syntax for your database. So if your company uses SQL Server, for example, then the row limit would not create a limit clause. Instead, you would query would create a top 10 clause. So, you know, every SQL has its own nuance and differences, 
Looker knows every nuance of every database and it's going to write the SQL for every database. So that's a really nice feature of Looker. So let me show you what we were talking about. So when it comes to, you know, adding a filter, you know, um, if we add a country filter and say USA, the run button. So in order to make something a filter, it's this, you know, triangle right here, filter by field. Uh, the first option is pivot. So that's to show something across columns. And then it just clicking it would show it you know, as a as a dimension or row, but um, in adding this in this this country equals USA filter, if we go down to the SQL, we see that it adds a where clause. Now, what if I want to um, make a filter on a metric? So let's say the user count has to be greater than ten. What you see is that it produces a having clause. So where where clauses are for dimensions, filtering on a dimension, and then having clauses are filtering on a metric. And the big distinction between having and where is the where clause comes before the aggregation, and then the having comes after the aggregation. You know of the SQL. It's important important distinction to know. How do we write dimensions and measures in LookML? Remember, dimensions are qualities or attributes of your data. Your model should already contain a dimension for each column in the database tables. We can also create what we call derived dimensions, which be, would be logical representations of columns. You may have already noticed that each of our auto-generated dimensions has a SQL parameter containing the word table in purple with a dollar sign and curly braces. The dollar sign and curly braces are looker substitution syntax. In other words, they designate variables or object references. Table references the table mentioned in the SQL table name parameter in the view file. This lets Looker know which database table to use when pulling the, the dimensions and measures. So when it came to like all the dimensions, the way they're called in the SQL statement is using this table uh, um, parameter. However, you know, when you're creating, for instance, uh, a calculated dimension, you're creating a virtual dimension, one that doesn't exist originally in the table, but it's going to act as a dimension. Um, when you, re you can reference, you know, you want to reference not the, the exact table field, but the, the dimension in Looker. And you notice that this code doesn't have the table parameter in front of it. It's just uh, referencing another dimension in the table, days since sign up. So that's what you want to do. You want, you know, when 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 Looker auto generates a project, it's going to create these di auto generated dimensions, and it's always going to have this, you know, a, a table reference, meaning that it's referencing the exact field from the table, and then anything that comes after that, you don't want to use the table reference. You want to just reference the LookML dimension without the table uh, parameter. So another type of substitution operator is putting a dimension or measure name within curly braces with a dollar sign at the front. Whenever you define new dimensions and measures that build on existing ones, use the field name substitution operator rather than the table reference, even when referencing fields that are merely underlying columns in the database. Using the LookML object name will follow dry code standards, which stands for don't repeat yourself, 
And this will reduce the number of times or places you'll need to make updates if something like a database column name changes. In these example measures, it doesn't look like it would make a big difference if we use table.salePrice or just sale price. However, referencing the looker object is always better than the hard-coded database column which it, because it inherits any transformations or additional logic from the overall dimension or measure. As we saw earlier in the project creation demo, Looker knows how to assign each auto-generated gener dimensions type by scanning the underlying column's data type. So when we created a project, Looker knows what's a dimension and what's an attribute just based on, or what's a dimension and what's a metric based on the variable type. If it's var car, string, car, it knows it's a dimension. If it's float or uh, decimal, it knows it's a metric. For new fields you define, you must assign a type. Otherwise, Looker will default to type string. String is the LookML term for what in your database dialog could be var car, car, or text. An example string type field would be the full name dimension, which concatenates two other string fields together. To make a new dimension, hit enter on the keyboard a couple times to start a new line and write the code dimension. So let's do this. So we're gonna write, make our first dimension a full name. And I am gonna give you that code. Oh, let me do it in here. So let's create our first um, calculated dimension, which would be full name. And all that full name does is it concatenates the first name and the last name together, putting a space in between. This is a, a calculated attribute, meaning that it doesn't exist in its raw form in the database. We are creating it off of uh, you know other columns in the database, that being first name and last name. So I am going to drop um, this piece of code in the chat. And what I want you to do is I want you to um, go into the user's view and and you can paste it anywhere in, in, the, in that view. Um, I put it right after last name. But yeah, please... Um, paste that full name code um, into, into your IDE. And then once you're done doing that, um, you hit save changes and validate LookML. Those are the two steps you need to do. You don't need to go any further. And then you go into your Explorer on the other tab and we can we can we can try out that new um, field that we just created. So full name. Let's just do um, total sales by by full name. Let's get rid of those. So now we're seeing total sales by full name. Does, does everybody, does that make sense to everybody? Did everyone get there? Did everyone paste uh, the full name into their IDE? Um, and, and were you able to see it in your own Explore instance? Uh, Danny, did we mention this earlier? My, my project looks like it's read only. I can't edit it. I don't know why. Are you in development mode? Um, I must not be. Go to develop oh. and then hit the development mode toggle. Okay. Thanks for calling that out. I got it. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh, no worries. So what we just did is uh, adding a column to the user view, right? So Correct. we should see that view, uh, the column name in under Explorer. Correct. And yep. 
Okay. So you would see it in the user's uh, panel. So name is full name. Do we need to refresh it? Um, yeah, great question. So after you hit saved and then and then the first button to validate, then you want to go into your explore tab and the first thing you want to do is refresh the browser and that will pick up all of the new changes that you just made. Make sense? Yep. I just refreshed it. I still don't see that column name though. Same here. Uh, I see it now. So I think it's under created date. Uh, oh no, sorry, my bad. Yeah, I see it now after refreshing it. And Great. Petitions. Uh, how do we drag that on Explorer? Simply drag and drop? Uh, simply clicking it. You don't have to drag. Oh, okay. Yep. There's there's three main options to do to any field. If you click it, that puts it as its own uh, column. Uh, there's the option of pivot. Um, that would show the show the attributes as columns. Um, and then there's the filter feature. So if you can filter by it. So those are the mm -hmm. three types of things that you can do. Okay. Similar yeah. to, you know, uh, Excel pivot table. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, the other thing I just want to show you, um, you guys didn't get to do this because you didn't, um, you just copied and pasted the code, but, um, I just want to show you how intuitive Looker is when it comes to, you know, writing something by hand. So when it comes to, when I, when I write like a new dimension, I'm going to write out full name. I never finish anything. I just let Looker you know, tell me what to do. So I just wrote dim, it knows it's a dimension. Uh, let's give the dimension a name, full name. Next step is to go in between these curly braces, hit enter, uh, type. So let it find type, string. So once again, I'm just trying to call out that, uh, let lookml write the code for you. Now, the one thing that you got to make sure you do right and lookml is not going to validate for you is what you're going to write inside of any sql or sql on parameter this is an exact you know you're telling the database exactly what to do if you notice you know this concat statement this is uh we're working with a redshift instance of data and um you know I, when it comes to like concatenating fields i'm used to uh, using the double pipes to concatenate but that option doesn't exist in red in redshift you got to use the concat um, so i just want to really call out that you know what you do inside this sql statement right here um, you need to get right it needs to be database specific and then you also need to know that that looker isn't gonna isn't gonna validate this code and tell you if it's right or not you're gonna have to know that for yourself um, now, if you write it wrong, you're you're going to be able to figure it out just by working with it. And I always recommend, um, much like the environment that we got going right now, you know, we're in the project uh, tab, and then we got the explore tab. And as we make any changes to the project tab, we just right away go to the explore tab and and validate it, see what it looks like as a you know as a table, at, you know, as we slice and dice the data. Uh, it really helps me just you know understand what I'm doing and I'm always constantly want to check the validity of everything I do right away instead of, you know, waiting a long time. Um, how about we take a break? I think we've, we've been at it for an hour and a half. Um, are you guys good with taking a 10 minute break? Yep. Okay. Let's reconvene at uh, 1240. Sound good? Yes. Thanks, Danny.
Okay.
All right, we'll give it another couple minutes. Is everyone back? I'm here. All right, how about we get started? Um, yeah, you guys might not have total sales yet in your in your model, but you certainly have count. Um, I didn't mention this before, but uh, every view that gets, here's a good learning experiment. Uh, I tried to go to a different view, but I have some unsaved changes. And so, you know, you, uh, just got... sharing. <laughs> oh, my apologies. <laughs> no problem. Always forget about that. We're all human. Um, just, uh, I just want to make a point. So I, I'm, I'm in users right now. I got the save changes. Let's say I I I I forget to save my changes. Uh, Looker's got your back. So I tried to go to the orders items, and it's telling me, "Hey, you got unsaved changes. Are you sure you want to leave this page? Uh, cancel. Make sure you always save and validate. Just make that a, a repetition of of doing that. Those two steps always." Um, and and what we were talking about uh, just before this is we created uh, a new dimension called full name, which is a concatenation of first and last name. And we uh, just made a simple uh, table of full name by count. And if you go into the, the SQL, um, this code right here is an exact copy of what you put in the Excel uh, in the SQL statement, I said before that Looker doesn't validate this piece. Uh, this is like the one piece that you you really got to know you got right. However, if you do get it wrong, like that, let's say I did that. So I made a mistake. I don't have a comma. Looker's not telling me that I made a mistake. How am I going to find out I made a mistake? If I refresh this explore, I get an error. So that's where you, you get, Looker tells you where you're making a mistake. It's going to try to evaluate the SQL, but it's going to, the database is going to give you an, an error. So that's worth knowing. You know, you, Looker's still got your back when it comes to, the code inside SQL, you just, you got to figure it out in the explore tab. So I made that switch. I saved, I validated, and now the SQL works. Um, so let's talk about, um, we showed you a, a dimension of type string in full name. Uh, now we're going to show you a dimension of type number, which is going to represent the days since signup. Number type fields should be used for columns of data type int, decimal, float, etc. When defining new dimensions, we should also use number whenever we do some sort of low-level mathematical calculation, like addition or subtraction. The most common use case for this is date difference logic, as shown 
you know, in this date since signup dimension. The computation is performed in the SQL parameter with the date diff function. Again, this is how it works in Redshift. If we were using BigQuery, then the SQL parameter would be, uh, it would be a little bit different, but it would look a lot similar. Let's, I'm gonna give you this, this dimension, days since sign up in the chat, and I want you guys to plug it in. So let me go get it. What view would you like us to put it in? Um, I will let you know that. Give me one moment, sure. please. Oh, why is this? Oh. I know why. Okay, I'm pasting in um, the days since sign up. And uh, yeah, feel free to, I want you to, to paste it in the um, in the order items view. That's why. Okay, so yeah, paste. Please paste it in, and I have to. I'm a step ahead because we're gonna do something else with dates and sign up. Let's. I validated it, and now let's take it into the explorer. So, let's find dates and sign up. Remember to refresh. And I'm just going to do a count count of rows by this new field. Um, another thing you want to know is this row limit. Uh, this helps out the database. It's not going to give you all the rows in a big table if the table is really big. The default is 500, but you can change this to a, like say a thousand. And it you see with the limit statement that's what this row limit controls since i changed it to a thousand now it says limit 1000. if you look at the the query um it even plugs in its own um time zone uh calculation we didn't have that in the code but when it references created date it's plugging in pretty much all this code, it knows to convert it from a uh, universal, or I don't know, UTC to, to America time zone. Anyway. I will say that's pretty slick that a lot of um, other applications don't handle. That can create quite a problem for users across multiple time zones. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it is very nice. Okay, the yes, no field type, we're gonna talk about that now, is a Boolean. It's either yes or no, or in other words, true or false. It evaluates the condition entered in the SQL parameter. If the criteria are met, then the value assigned is yes. In this example, if the days since sign up field is less than or equal to 90 days, the record will be assigned the yes value in the is new customer field. These fields are particularly useful when created filtered measures where we would filter by a yes, no value. Did you notice how we built is new customer on the dimension from the previous slide, day since sign up? We could have just as well written the SQL parameter that did everything that day since sign up does and include it in this yes, no, but why would we rewrite the whole date diff again when we could simply point looker to the dimension that already has it? So that's another really important thing is you want to branch off dimension to dimension so that 
when you're working with a dimension and you call another dimension, it's going to it's going to work off of all the changes that you made with that dimension. So they branch off each other. So let's sh let's uh, I'm going to plug in. Um, I'm going to give you this piece of code, the is new customer. Please give me a moment and we're going to I'll show you how that works. Um, it would be in the users. Oh, let's just find it this way. Oh, it's in the order items. So in the order items, please uh, paste this code. Another thing that I, you know, want to just want you guys to do, I already mentioned it before, but, um, you know, we'll do it this time. But on your own, just go through the steps of how to write the dimension by hand and just notice that you don't really need to memorize anything. Uh, you just allow Looker to create the code for you. So I typed in dim. Um, I click that option, I hit tab, tab is what you hit. And then let's name it as new customer. Going between the curly brackets and um, yeah, type and SQL are the two main parameters that you, you're gonna enter in uh, for most uh, dimensions. So type, let it type, hit tab. This one's a yes, no. Is it? Yeah. I mean, I always let, uh, look or finish every word for me. Just that helps me know that it's the right syntax. But anyway, yeah. So I hope that helps. You know, when it comes to writing Lookml, it's it's a really nice feature. Just the way that Looker uh, finishes uh, the words for you, and it really helps you, you know, write the code you want. You don't really need to memorize too much about exact syntax in Looker. You can just rely on Looker um, helping you out. And I, I take full advantage of that because I find memorization to be difficult. Let's work with this is new customer field. Um, save, validate. Now go into your explore, refresh. And let's find is new customer. And there it is. And then if we look at the SQL, notice that it inherently took in all of the logic from um, you know, the, the, the dimension that we defined previously, which was day since sign up, it, it took everything that was in that dimension and plugged it into the SQL. And that's really nice. It, you know, yes, no's are always evaluated using a case when statement. So if day since, since sign up is less than or equal to 90, then yes, else no. So yeah, pretty cool. Let's move on. Um, the next one we're going to talk about are tier dimensions, which are very useful for bucketing uh, numeric values. In the tiers parameter, you need to indicate which buckets you'd like to assign. Each comma separated number will be the start of a range. So this will produce one bucket for below zero, then zero through 29, 30 through 89, 90 through 179. I'm going it off of uh, the tiers example that you see in this code right here. There is also a style parameter where we can specify how we would like the results to be formatted to end users. I personally find integer the most user friendly. And uh, just so you understand, you know, what type of SQL statement do you think both the yes, no, and the tier types will produce their case when statements? This will also produce a case when when statement, just like um, is new customer did. 
let me sh give you this piece of code. Okay, I pasted the day since sign up tier uh, in the chat. Please paste it into the order items view. And let's just study it. So it's a dimension. It's of type tier. That's, that's the important distinction, type tier. In the SQL statement, you don't really need to do anything. All you got to do is just plug in the, uh, the dimension that you're referring to. And we're referring to the derived uh, dimension days and sign up that we created earlier and then the tiers is just the the splits between the the buckets and then style you're usually just going to always use integer um, there's a there's a couple other options though so save and commit hit save and commit and then go into your explore refresh it And let's do um, the row count by days since sign up tier. This is something we want sorted that way. And there you go. There's the row count by this days since sign up tier. This is how it's formatted. Um, it, you know, it creates these uh, tier values for you based on the on the on the tier attributes based on this part right here. So you didn't do anything to create uh, what these say. It, Looker does it for you. And then look at how crazy this uh, case win statement is. It's um, you know it produces a lot of code just because we're like the third you know, level of, a, of an attribute being created off another attribute. So, uh, you know, everything with the days and sign up logic is being inherited in here, but while it's doing is producing, uh, first of all, it's creating a sorting case when statement. Notice that uh, the values are just one, two, three, four, um, and that's the sort field. So the first column is a sort field, and then the next column is the actual value. And then the order by is by the the sort field, so it's doing a you know a lot of lot of a lot for you uh, to create this result. Um, but LookML's you know doing it all for you. You're not having to write any code. So yeah, that's pretty cool. As mentioned earlier, when Looker detects date and time columns, it creates dimension groups for them. This is because the precise time may not be useful in analytics. Instead, business users may want to see rollups by day, week, month, etc. So with the dimension group of type time, we use the time frames parameter to specify the date and time parts required for the business. So let's take a look at this dimension group. And I actually think that this is one that is already existing. Yeah. So we're just referring to uh, what dimension groups do. And know that anytime you have a date or date time or time, uh, you know, I don't know about time, but date and date time, it's going to, if, 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 if a field like that exists in, in, a, in a raw table, Looker's going to create a dimension group off of it automatically. So this code was already auto-generated when the project created itself. It's generating all these different time frames for of which you want to see created by. Notice that created just says created. It's not created date. Um, let's take this into uh, 
into the explorer and i'll show you you know what this looks like so we go to created where's created Oh, we, we, we haven't talked about this yet, but um, I'll talk about it later. But I added a label to this dimension group. Instead of it showing up as created, you don't see created. You actually see registered. But just know that, uh, let, me, let me get rid of that first. Oh, am I right? You guys already have this code in your environment, this created time uh, dimension group? Is that correct? Yeah, I think we do. Okay. So I just uh, commented out registered. I'm going to refresh. And this is what you guys should be seeing in your environment. Uh, you see a drop down for created date. And it's got a different, a lot of different ways to slice and dice the data. All of these values, so let's just say month. So create month. All of these values are defined right here. So there's ten or so different ways that uh, you want to slice a date field, and it, they're all right here in the dropdown. So that's a really nice feature of Looker. You know, when it works with dates, anytime it sees a date or date time field, it's going to create a dimension group for you and slice and dice the data by uh, all these different values. Um, another thing that I also find very important, you know, when it comes to any data viz tool, you want to work with date tables. Um, you know, you guys might have your own fiscal calendar, um, and there's, you know, aside from these ways to slice and dice date fields there's there's still hundreds of other ways that you might want to slice and dice a date so um, you know i think it's it's valuable to to work off both dimension groups and off date tables in our example we don't have a date table but um, i hope you guys understand what i mean when when i say you know using a date table to 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 drive the analytics of of time series anything with 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 date um, yeah, looking at the the SQL behind the scenes, it it, it already made the code to to uh, convert uh, the raw date field into a, a year month uh, attribute. Um, so yeah. So another important distinction. So when you want to use one of the dimension group timeframes in another dimension or measure, for example, um, in a dimension performing a date diff function, make sure you append the desired date or time part to the name of the dimension group. So for instance, um, if you're referencing created, let me show you what we're talking about so when i define this dimension group all i put was created i didn't put created date i just put created and what looker does is it appends all 10 of these values so if i want to look at created date it would just be created underscore and then date and that's exactly what I do in this date since sign up. I'm referencing created date. And created date is, is a part of this dimension group. It's, it's referencing created and then the date part of created. So you concatenate created. If I wanted to say created year, all I would say was created underscore year. Um, so it's important to understand that like when you're working with dimension groups, uh, when, when it comes to like the 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 name of these variables um it's it's the value that you define here so created and then you append 
you know, date or week or month to the name when you want to reference it uh, throughout your LookML, like I do for dates and sign up. So we can just simply write created underscore whatever we need date, day, or week, or month, right? Yes. We don't need to con concatenate that separately. Correct. Yeah, you okay. just, yep. OK, that's good. Thanks. There is one other dimension group type, which is duration. This actually eliminates the need to write a dimension like the aforementioned day since signup, which did a redshift date diff with the intervals parameter uh, that you see in this code right here. We can allow business users to choose from a range of time intervals. Uh, for instance, seconds, hours, days. You know, we defined a, a field called days since signup. This dimension group is going to give us months since signup weeks since sign up, quarters since sign up, all of that. So this is even better than the days since sign up dimension that we defined earlier. So date diff works great when, when your dates are 18 or 180 days apart. But when it's something weird, you're gonna, pref you're gonna prefer to see the difference in weeks, months, or even years. So that's what makes this better than just days since sign up. And when it's something that's less than 24 hours, you're going to want to see something more granular like hours or minutes in sign up. So creating dimension groups of type duration is better than writing dimensions that perform date diff functions in the SQL parameter for two reasons. One, you're not hard coding the date part, so your end users can choose what works best for them. And two, you're letting Looker write the function for you, which is easier and less risky if you're not as comfortable with SQL. And this will create less work for yourself in the future in case your company ever decides to change data warehouses. So I'm going to give you this piece of code, and we're going to have to do some things. We're going to fill. We're going to comment out the the original days and sign up uh, dimension that we created, and we're going to replace it with this one. I am pasting um, the code for this uh, duration type dimension group. And I come, or, uh, I'm going to highlight out. Uh, I'll, I'll show you this, guys, just so you know. Um, I got days since sign up defined twice. I got it defined right here, days since sign up. And then I got it defined also here. Even though this says since sign up, there's a day component to it. And um, you know, in the prior example uh, for dimension groups of type date, you know, this is going to be created time, created date, created week. But for type duration, it's going to be seconds since sign up, minutes since sign up. So it's a prefix instead of a suffix. This is you know, days since sign up. So um, So I tried to validate this looker, and it gave me an error. And the reason why the error exists is because it's got days and sign up defined twice. So um, you know, just another scenario where looker's got your back. Um, since this uh, dimension group of uh, since sign up is far superior than just the original days and sign up, let's highlight out the days and sign up uh, dimension. And just work with the 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 tier or the duration dimension group instead. So let's refresh our explorer. And it shows up in your explorer as duration duration since sign up. And then if you click down on, on it. It gives you all of the different ways of which you want to see 
uh, sign up. So let's look at um, just years since sign up. So now it's saying, you know, all you know, how many years since the user signed up? Uh, so four is the maximum. And it creates um, a big confusing case win statement that you see here. All right. So uh, for dimension groups of type time, I mentioned we would need to append an underscore in the desired time frame for use in other fields. Dimension groups of type duration have a similar requirement except prepending. If we want to use one of the dimension group intervals in another dimension or measure, we need to write the interval before the dimension group name itself, like hours enrolled, days enrolled, years enrolled, for, for this example in our uh, in, in the slide. So in the UI, dimension groups of type duration will appear with the word duration in front of the dimension group name. The example would therefore appear as duration enrolled. And for our example, like I said before, it's so what I typed in was since sign up. In the Explorer, it shows up as duration since sign up, and then it gives you all the options. And when you're referencing any one of these, it's days since sign up, hours since sign up, minutes since sign up, it's prepending. Whereas when you're working with a dimension group of type date, um, it shows up as created date in the dropdown. And then if you were to reference month, it'd be created month, created quarter, created week. So it's a, you know, the duration prepends. And then uh, a date um, appends, I think is the right word. So just so you understand, you know, it's dimension groups um, create uh, dimension value, you know, names for you. Uh, and you just got to understand, uh, you know, the, the chorus of it, you know, why and how it's doing it. All right, we got an exercise time. Um, uh, I have a question, Danny. So uh, when we have this created uh, dimension, right? So the name should be created, not created date, right? Correct. If you were to put created date, it would be created date date, created date month. It would actually, you know, say it twice, which would be silly. That makes sense? Yeah but it looks like my dimension group is created but when i'm checking on explore it says created date yeah that is just the header of the of you notice how it's a drop down yeah. with others so it says created date and that's like the header to the the dimension group um that is by default yeah that is by default Okay. Okay. Yeah. I thought uh, I, there is no created date. Why is showing created date? Okay, that is by default because it's a date column. Yep. Thanks. Okay, it's exercise time. Um, I, I don't want you guys to struggle too much through this. I will, you know, guide you through what the answers are. And we'll, we can just, um, you know, work on this step by step. So uh, if you want to do it on your own, you certainly can. Um, I'm supposed to give you guys eight minutes to, to do this. Um, but I, I figure, I'd, you know, if I were in your shoes, I'd rather just be shown, you know, what to do and, and instead of trying to struggle through it. Um, let's talk about the first one. So we want to know which cities have the most customers. And anytime you're working with city, you got to always make sure that you're appending the state to the city because 
you know, there's there's a much, bunch of different Franklins, Mount Vernons, Newports. Um, so you always want to append state. So for the first example, we're going to do, uh, you know, we already we already went through this uh, when I was walking through, but we are going to append city and state together. So I'm going into the users, and um, so the first the first question is asking us to we want to slice and dice data by by city, and we just got to make sure that we append state to city. So in our first example, uh, within the users uh, view, we're going to create a dimension called city state, and this is um, the same as as the other you know the first dimension that we created. Uh, I forget what that was, but I can paste this code for you, give it to you. So plug that code into cities into into the users um, view. Save and validate it, and let's check it out. So there, yeah, now we got, um, you know, city and state concatenated together. So this is appropriate. If we didn't put state, then it would link, the, you know, cities across different states as one value, which makes no sense. And all that uh, Looker is doing behind the scenes is creating this SQL statement, this concatenation, which is the exact definition that we described in the SQL. I didn't mention this yet. These double uh, semicolons is very important. This tells Looker when to stop reading uh, the SQL statement. So this is always necessary for any SQL or SQL on parameter. You always got to have those double semicolons. Um, Looker creates them for you. So just remember not to erase them when you're when you're creating dimensions. Okay, the next question: How many customers do we have in each age group? We don't care about specific ages like 20, 21, 22. We want to see them in age groups. So this means we're going to have to create a tier. We did that already. Let me find aged here so this is uh what i did i can paste this in the code paste it in the chat so yeah the age tier is we're bucketing uh the age uh dimension into into age buckets 18 25 35 etc let's save and validate and when we Look at it in the Explorer. We got a new tier called H tier, or new new dimension called H tier. And there we go. There's the dimension. There's the distribution. You know, most of our uh, the people in this data set are actually rather young. Uh, most are below 18, and it tapers off as the age increases. And behind the scenes, when it comes to tiers, it's creating two case win statements. One is for sorting, and the next one is the actual value. And it just makes sure that the sorting is by the, the sort parameter and not the, the value. So quick question, Danny. Yes. So in this count measure, right, like so, if I wanted to do like distant count, can I update in the SQL or should I open in a separate SQL uh, 
runner instance and modify there. Uh, we haven't yet, yeah, we haven't dis yet discussed, you know, distinct count, but um, we, yeah, you know, pretty soon we're going to start talking about uh, mm -hmm. defining measures. Um, distinct counts are very easy. You, you just let, you know, Looker do it for you. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't yet reached distinct count. We'll get there soon, though. Okay. The next question is how successful is email as a traffic referral source for us compared to all other channels? So this sounds like a yes, no um, uh, dimension. We want to know if, if the traffic is email or not. So I am going to find that. So I created a dimension, a yes, no dimension in the users field because uh, traffic source is, is in the users table. Let me plug this in and give it to you guys. So this is a type yes, no. So this is a Boolean uh, type dimension. And in the SQL statement, all you got to do is uh, type in the, the true statement. So when traffic store source equals email, then this is going to be yes, otherwise no. And I'll show you that, you know, in the SQL. So let's save and validate. And then let's go into the Explorer, refresh it. And let's see what is email source looks like. So this is what... Um, this this yes no it actually you know is email source is the name it it automatically adds that yes no to to uh, after it it's a simple yes no and if we look at the the SQL what we defined in the code was just the yes statement the what 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 is yes so traffic source equals email so this code right here is all we had to put into uh lookml traffic source equals email then yes else no so you know i think it does take some practice trying to intuitively understand what belongs in each um sql statement for each type of dimension um, but yeah, you'll get the hang of it. Um, we'll, we're going to go through a lot more examples, so uh, it, it will definitely come easier to us. All right, the last uh, question. What's the average number of days it takes for our orders to ship? What about the min and the max? So this sounds like a, a duration dimension group. Give me one moment. Let me. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm plugging this. Uh, this code into you for this dimension group. Um, we're calling it shipping days. Let's talk about it. So this is the dimension group of type duration. And we haven't talked about this yet. Um, this really makes Looker simple when it comes to uh, date difference functions. In our prior example, we actually uh, wrote out the exact date diff function. But in this example, we don't need to do that. 
there's actually two uh, looker parameters called SQL start and SQL end. And you intuitively just plug in what the start value is and what the end value is. So in this example, the, the shipping duration is the delivery date minus the ship date. And we're going to show it in days, weeks, and months. And we could actually you know, add more if we want. Um, but let's just check out those. So let's save and validate. And go into our Explorer, refresh. What do we call it? Shipping days. So it's going to show up as duration shipping days. Remember, duration is always going to show up. And then shipping days is what we defined right here. And then when we drop down, it's going to give you in days, months, and weeks. That's what we defined right here. We could have added hours, seconds, any time frame we wanted. So let's look at just days. Let me get rid of. Remove. So yeah, and behind the scenes, it's doing the the date diff logic uh, on its own. It, it's not even using a date diff function. It's using subtraction of one, the first date of to the last what date. Um, I don't fully understand what it's doing, and I don't feel like I need to. Looker does it for you. You know, this is what makes Looker great. It knows everything about Redshift and all of its SQL uh, nuances, and it does everything uh, for you all of you know this difficult code you don't need to you don't need to write or worry about looker figures out all the date conversion all the all the stuff that takes a lot of code and it hurts to memorize uh, lookers doing that for you so all right let's start talking about some fun stuff. This is all fun stuff, but I'm excited to talk about measures. So far, we've all we've just been talking about dimensions, which are, you know, the group buys, the attributes, you know, but that's only, you know, one part of the equation. The second part is measures, which are, you know, what are you aggregating by, or not, um, you know, what what values, what what numbers do you want to aggregate to see in the group buys? So yeah, measures perform aggregate functions in SQL. For the most part, measures point to one or more existing looker dimensions in the SQL parameter and define a way to aggregate them in a type parameter. To clarify, the type parameter for a measure integrates the aggregate function, whereas for dimensions, we learned it indicates the data type. Sum, average, and count are the most common types. The other one is count distinct. I think that's another one of the most common types. Um, so now I'm going to give you our first two measures, total sales and average sales. Give me one moment. Let me find them. So in the order items, let's find total sales and average sales. So I'm going to give you these two together. These are our first two measures. And let's talk about them. So, the, so let's focus on these three right now. This dimension was created for us automatically. Like I said, when Looker creates a project, it creates a dimension for every single field in the table. So sales price, that's a metric, but it's still gonna create it as a dimension. Now, in reality, who's gonna use sales price as a dimension? You know, you're never gonna, I mean, show you what 
what would happen if you, you know, what's the point of this? Who's, who's going to want to group by a, a sales price? You always want to aggregate sales price. Um, we, we're going to talk about this later, but this is of no value to the explorer. We can hide it. And that's, that's what you want to do with, um, you know, the metrics that come out as dimensions. You, you keep the code that Looker creates for you, but you just add the hidden parameter to hide it because you're never going to want to see uh, sales price as a dimension. You're going to want to see it as total sales or average sales. So let's talk about total sales. You tell what type it is. So um, type could be either sum, average, count, count distinct. And then in the SQL parameter, you don't, all you got to enter is the field name. So in this situation, sales price. And notice that this dimension has the table uh, prefix. So it's referencing a raw field in your table. But this is just referencing this dimension in Looker. So it's the second level. And that's, that's what you want. You don't want this. It, it, it would be possible to have that. But that's not what you want to do. You want to have, uh, you want to reference uh, the dimension rather than the raw field. Uh, value format name, um, that tells you how you want, how, how does the value want to come out? Um, there's two parameters, and we're going to talk about this later. There's value format and value format name. Both do the same thing, but in a different way. Value format name is more English. So in this scenario, USD stands for US dollars. So it's uh, pretty simple. You know, you can just look at documentation to see all the different uh, values there could be for format name. Let's save and validate. And let's see what this looks like uh, in our Explore. So let's look at age tier, and then instead of count, now we can look at our first two measures that we created, total sales and average sales. And there we go. So, you know, that makes sense. It's showing total sales and average sales by age tier. And if we go to the SQL, uh, the case wins for uh, the age tier, but um, if we look at uh, the measures, the SQL for the for the two metrics that we just created, total sales and average sales, it it generates uh, it for you. You see how it actually does a coalesce, replaces um, missing with zero. So Looker's are automatically doing that, doing some some data cleaning that it knows it ought to do. Um, yeah, that makes sense, guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. Now, give me one moment. So we just talked about sums and averages. The other two very common are count and count distinct. Count measures do not point to a dimension to aggregate because type count does the equivalent of count star, which counts all the rows in a table. In some cases, the type count counts the primary key, which is basically the same thing. And we're going to get to that in later detail. But Looker automatically creates a count measure for each view. Like I said, uh, you know, you're going to see it in your explorers. Um, if you go to any view, any view at the bottom, Looker automatically creates a count measure for you. And this is just a count star of the table. Um, I think you should definitely keep those, uh, you know, those measures in, in your explorer. They do, you know, have some value, especially for validation. 
um, and they do have meaning on the business end. But yeah, that's just worth to know that um, you know the account of a table is is already included for you in every single view. All right, let me give you these uh, these two measures. Count items ordered and count users. All right, here they are. Let me plug those and give them to you. And uh, let's put these, these belong in the uh, order items view. So the first one, which is the count of items ordered, and it's of type count, uh, notice that there is no uh, value that it's pointing to. There's no field that it's pointing to because all it is is a count star of the table. Um, the other one is a count distinct. Very easy to implement. This is going to count the uh, distinct number of users. So you plug in user ID, and this is going to do a count distinct on user ID. So let's play with those in the Explorer. Let's do it by city, state. We can keep that count. Count users. So this first metric is a is a count star. It's a row count um, of the order items table, and then. Uh, count users is a distinct count of user ID. So if we go into the SQL, the count type is just a count star of the row of, of the table. And then uh, the count distinct writes it just like I would, you know, count, and then it's got the distinct statement. That's how you would write a, a count distinct in SQL. Make sense? Exercise time already. All right, the first question, how many orders were made week over week this year to date in the US by Facebook users? So uh, this is calling for a count distinct function on the uh, on the field order ID. We just want to get the, the distinct count of orders. Note that this data uh, is unique. The order items table is like a, I mean, I think of this as a, as a typical uh, e-commerce store. And um, this is the, the transactional table. It's unique by order ID and then item ID. So it's all of the items in, in a basket. Um, for an e-commerce store. Now, since this table is unique by order ID and item ID, we just want to get the count of orders, which is just one of order ID. Let me give you that um, code. Let me find it. Orders. Yeah. So I am giving you the code for count of orders. Uh, this belongs in the order items view. And the code is really simple, you know, for a count distinct. It's just type count distinct 
and you just put the order ID in it. We're going to talk about this later, but I added a, a description to this measure. This is a new uh, type of functionality. Uh, let me show you what it looks like. So let's save and validate, and let's go to the Explore. This is called Count of Orders. So let's plug in Count of Orders. So this description, I, I added a description called Account of Unique Orders. That shows up right here. So if you hit info, this info button, now we got a description. So, I mean, this is definitely extra credit, you know, if you want to do it. Um, if this is like, a, you know, what we're planning to build, um, it sounds like, you know, this is this could be of, of high value to, to our business analysts uh, providing a description for every field. Uh, that's how it's done. Let's hit the run button. So this is the count of orders by city state. There's a lot of cities. And then the, the SQL is just a simple count distinct. Um, the next question, how much sales revenue did we make last quarter? Um, we already added this, so we don't need to talk about it, but this calls for a metric of total sales, which we already created. Um, so yeah, we don't need to worry about that. And then the second one too, or the next one too. What is the average sale amount? That's average sales. And we already defined that as well. I already gave those to you. We have done some solid work with dimensions and measures so far. Now we will dis discuss some more advanced logic for them. As I suggested earlier, we can use dimensions to filter measures. The top example shows a count measure being filtered by a gender dimension. The generated SQL would be along the lines of select counts case when, I'm not gonna say it, sorry. The bottom shows a total sales measure summing only sales to new users. So basically what we're talking about is filtered measures. So we've showed you measures. Uh, this one is of type count, but we're actually going to add a filter to it as well. This is just the count of female users. Although filter parameters do not use substitution syntax, they still actually refer to LookML dimensions, not literal database column names. Substitution syntax is only used in the SQL parameter and parameters that start with SQL, such as SQL on. Filters use what are called looker filter expressions. These two examples essentially use the equals operator, gender equals female, and then the second one is user, new user equals yes. But that's not the only thing filters are capable of. Check out the documentation page for more examples of string wildcards relative date periods, numeric ranges, and other flexible filtering measures, methods. So I'm gonna give you these two um, measures and we'll plug them into our model. So these would be count female users. That would definitely be in the user table. There it is. So this is a, a simple count measure. It doesn't, it, since it's count, it doesn't reference any fields. It's just a row count, but it there is a, a filter that we're adding to it, uh, gender equals female. So I just pasted uh, the code to you. Please plug it into the um, user's view. 
Let's save and validate. And let's play with it. So this is showing um, the count of female users by city state. I also plugged in just user count. This number is always gonna be greater than this since this is, has a filter added to it. And when you go into the, the SQL, it's a case when statement. So this fil the, the way these filters operate, it adds a case when statement. So when the gender equals female, uh, then user ID. So going back to you know this measure, all we entered in, telling it is a count, and we just entered uh, the the true value of when gender equals female, and it auto generates uh, the SQL for you using a a, ca a case you know a a count distinct, so a measure with a case win statement inside of it, which is uh, pretty slick. Total sales. Okay, the next uh, filtered measure I'm going to give you belongs in the order items uh, view. This is uh, total sales for the email source. We're, we're filtering on uh, an email source. Uh, this is a yes, no uh, mention that we already created prior. Take that code and, and please plug it into uh, order items view. As you see here, we, we tell it it's a type sum. What sum of what? What are we summing? We're summing sales price. Uh, we're filtering on where is email source equals yes. And then we're giving it a US dollar format name. So let's save and validate. Oh, don't do that. So now we're just looking at total sales for the email source by city state. And similar to uh, what we, our prior example, it's a, it's a metric with a case win inside of it. So case win traffic source equals email, then plug in the sale price value, else null. So back to what we entered in, in the code, we just entered is email source equals yes, and that automatically generates um, where users traffic source equals email. It's telling you this logic, so pretty cool stuff. Next, next level. Measures can also have two or more measures that interact with each other. For example, we may want to know the percentage of female users, which would be calculated as the count of female users divided by the count of all users. Whenever we want to put measures in a SQL, in the SQL of a measure, we need to use the type number. This is a generic non-aggregating type. We're telling Looker not to apply an aggregation up front and instead to use the aggregations already built into the measures in the SQL parameter. There are two reasons for this. If we were to use type count for percentage female users, the generated SQL would be select count count, which is called a nested, ag a nested aggregate and is not permitted in any SQL dialect. dialect. 
So if you you can't have a, a an aggregate of an aggregate, you can't you can't ever do that in SQL. That's called a nested aggregate, and that's not allowed. Um, the other reason: what if we wanted to use two different aggregations, such as sum of sale price divided by the count of users, to determine the average sale price per user? It would not make sense to, to specify just one aggregation type up front. So let's show you what this is. So um, this uh, example is, is much different than, than, than the other examples of measures because uh, all this measure does is reference other, other measures. So there is no aggregation that takes place. The, the data is already inherently pre-aggregated uh, you know, based on uh, count female users and count. So this is just a, a, a simple arithmetic between two measures. Anytime you're doing that, uh, since there is no aggregation and we got to avoid nested aggregates, uh, the type is always number. It's it's not type sum or type count. It's it's of type number because it's there is no aggregation that we're going to do. It's already pre-aggregated. Let me give you that code. So please take this code and plug it into the user's view. And since you know this, this is the the percentage of female users. We want to know what's the percentage of female users of all of the users in this in this data. So since it's referencing other measures, it's always going to be of type number. Anytime you're referencing a diff another measure. It's going to be of type number. And this is a percentage, so uh, we don't have to do any multiply by 100, any of that um, stuff. We keep it as its raw decimal value. And we just apply the value format name of percent one. Percent one is going to be one decimal. We could do percent two, and that would be two decimals. So let's see this in the Explorer. Let's save and validate. And let's go to the Explorer, refresh. And I'm going to click um, all three of these uh, measures, the count, the count of female users, and the percentage of female users. Uh, percentage of female users is going to be the division of the first two uh, me measures, and that's why I, I want them all three together. So this 55% is 1682 divided by 3057. So 55% of all the users in New York New City are female. And if we look at uh, the SQL behind the scenes, um, well, there's there's no easy way for SQL to do this, but it's it's got to you know uh, calculate uh, the percentage of female users um, in its raw form. So um, Sorry, give me a moment. I'm trying to understand this. So uh, this piece of code right here, it's the same as uh, count female users. So this is the numerator of, of, of the division. And then um, count distinct user ID is, is the, the denominator. Um, so in creating this, you know, this measure that represents uh, arithmetic off other measures, it's got to go all the way back to the well. It can't reference, you know, city state in itself. It's, it's, it's got, or not city state, but users count and count female users. It's got to, you know, in, in its definition, it's, it's, it's creating it uh, in its raw form.
Um, so, Danny, you were saying we have uh, for this one, we will use a uh, number type and value format name is percentage underscore one. So, I mean, percentage underscore one will be a uh, standard for if if we are doing any percentage measure. Or, yes. yes. Okay. So, this underscore one does not make any uh, um, difference, right? If we need to make any change into percentage calculation. Yeah, the, the one is just telling you how many decimal places for the percent. So I think oh, the, okay. the, the, it could be percent underscore zero, one or two. I think those would be the three. Decimal, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Thanks. We can reference dimensions and measures from other view files by fully scoping them, same as you would do in SQL. In LookML, you write the view name in a period before the field name, all within the curly braces following a dollar sign. When you have cross view references like these, note that the two views involved need to be joined together in an explore. Okay, this is a, a difficult concept, um, very important concept. Um, what we're doing special in this example is we're referencing a field that doesn't exist uh, in the order items table, but exact, exists in the inventory items table. Um, so, so we're we're going to define profit in in the in the order items table, but its its ingredients is is a is a field that comes from a different table. And anytime you reference uh, a, a field that comes from a different table, you got to tell it what the view name. So it's a two level name. It's inventory items dot cost instead of just cost because cost belongs in a different table. So sales price, since it doesn't have a two level name, you know, it's, it's already in the order items table. That's why you don't need to reference what view it comes in. It's, it already knows it's in order items, but if it belongs in anything different, then you got to define the view. And, and then the other important thing to, talk about which we haven't yet discussed is in order for their uh, in order for this to even work we have to already have the joins between these two tables defined in an explorer or else it doesn't know what to do um, let me give you that code profit Well, I'm giving you uh, two uh, chunks of code, and they both uh, belong in the order items view. So the first one is the definition of profit, which is sale price minus cost. And this very special thing is that cost belongs in the inventory items table. So it belongs, inventory items is here. There's cost. Um, now we haven't talked about this yet but how does it know how to join um how does how does it know the relationship between order items and inventory items it doesn't and it'll give you an error unless you have it defined already in your, in your explorer so in in our root explorer which is the order items explorer we have inventory items already joined in and we're going to talk about this later, but it, it's joined by specific parameters. It knows it's a left outer join. And here are the, the join keys. And then it's a many to one relationship. And they all are many to one. And they're all left outer, which tells us that this is a star schema data model. But we need to have the join defined. It needs to know how to join these two tables together in order for... Um, this to even make sense in order to even reference a field from a different view. Now, this is a metric. Profit is a metric, but step one is to is to define it as a dimension. Uh, so this is a calculated dimension, type number. Um, I said this before, but this is a metric. 
and it's defined as a dimension, you're never going to do anything with with that, so you can hide it. That will hide profit as a dimension. You you rarely ever want to see a metric as a dimension. You always want to see it as a measure. And our next uh, measure that we're creating off of profit is called total profit. And this is a sum of this dimension that we created. So sum, and then all we put in is profit. Um, and this is another important distinction that I want to make. So I said before that there's two different ways to format a, a metric. There's value format name and there's value format. So far, I've only showed you value, value format name. And uh, you've seen US dollar, USD. The other uh, way to do it is, is Excel style or spreadsheet style. So value format and these two USD versus uh, this format, they're synonymous. They're the, they do the same thing, but they're written in different ways. When it comes to working with the value format, it's it's rather intuitive. You know, in this scenario, I want it to be a dollar, so I'm attaching a dollar at the front. Um, I want it to be comma separated, so numeral, comma, numeral, numeral, numeral uh, is, is a way to write that out. And then I want it to have two decimal places, so dot zero, zero. Um, there's documentation on value format, and, and uh, you can get the gist of it um, if, if you read that. but I just wanted to show you that there's two ways to define the format of a value. Um, I prefer the value format name. It, it's it's easier. It makes sense. But you can do it both ways. So let's play with uh, total profit. Okay, once again, we're showing total profit by city. And it's really cool what, what's going on in the SQL. Because uh, the ingredients to make profit is sale price minus cost. And since cost already er, belongs in a different table, it knows to join in that table. And through the explore definition, where we defined three parameters for every join. So for inventory items, we turn the type, the left outer, the, the relationship many to one, and the SQL on, this is what the join keys are. So that equates to a left join because, uh, I mean, I left outer, and many to one, they, to me, they, they kind of define the same thing. It, it's telling you it's a left outer join. So yeah, it, um, it, you know, Looker and LookML um, is really smart. It, it does, it, when it needs to join in other tables to build a metric, it, it does that on the fly for you. And, and you define you know, the parameters of the join uh, through LookML, uh, through the Explorer, and, and you don't have to enter too many information uh, to get it right, and it, it's very intuitive. So once again, I'm just saying that um, fields that reference other views require an explorer with defined joins for both involved views. So in order to bring in that cost value, we needed to have the join definition in the explorer. All right, exercise time. The first question, how successful is email as a traffic referral source for us compared to other channels? Um, so for this step, we're going to create a, a measure called total sales for the email source. Let me show you that one. 
Danny, I see someone raised their hand. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anyone have a question? Oh, you want to take a break? Yeah, we can. Are you guys all ready for a break? Um, we only have till 2.50, so we got um, about 45 minutes left. Why don't we take, um, can we uh, reconvene at 2.15? Yep, sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yep, seven minute break. Cool. <laughs>
All right, let's get started. Okay, um, exercise time. Uh, the first question, how successful is email as a traffic referral source for us? So this is calling uh, for us to build a filtered measure, uh, the sum of sales, but filtering on a email source. Let me find, let me give you this code. Please plug that code into the order items view and we can talk about it. So this measure is called total sales email source. And um, what we're doing is we're summing sale price, but we're also adding a filter to it where is email source equals yes. So let's uh, show what that looks like. So I'm showing total sales and then the email source total sales by city. And if you just look at the, the SQL, um, total sales is easy. It's just sum of sales. But um, the total sales email source is the same uh, sum of sale price, but it's got a case when statement in it. It's, it's uh, classifying it as when traffic source equals email. So that's how that works. The next question, does the percentage of sales attributed to the email source out of the total sales overall increase or decrease over time? Yes, Jack? Uh, I was just wondering if it's, there's a filter option in the Explorer. Um, tab as well is it easier to use that as a filter or, or do you think it's easier to use it as like in the measure dimension that you're writing in the uh sorry the view itself um yeah it all depends on um uh, what you really want to do um you know while you're exploring um it certainly is you know important to use the the filter uh functionality where you can filter in anything um but um much like what what i'm going to do next which is calculate the percentage of total sales with the email source uh for that scenario you can't work with uh the filters to create that percentage you're going to need uh you know total sales email source as a baked in measure so they, they, uh, you know, they they certainly have two different use cases, but um, you know, uh, using the filtered measure certainly has its its needs. So they both certainly have their needs, and and I recommend you you make use of of both of them. Okay, thanks. So yeah, the the next question is is a is a percentage question. Let me give you the code for that. It's right here. So um, this is uh, a measure, but it's built off of two other measures. It's a percentage is what we're calculating, the percentage of sales that are email source. and. Uh, so since it's uh it's built off of other measures then it is always type number that's important to know and then uh the sql statement has the division uh in it um which is total sales email source divided by total sales you got a null if zero that's a you know to help um 
for missing values. And then I think the 1.0 times total sales, that turns it from an integer to a one decimal. That's a that's like a cheap trick you can use in SQL to um, force decimals. You know, 1.0 times anything is gonna give you another decimal in SQL. So that's just a trick, not looker specific. Did I send that to you guys? I did. So let's um, let's play with that. So there you go. Um, percentage sales email source, the 14.18 is the uh, 75 divided by 533. And uh, we, we talked about this before, but when it came to defining this percent sales email source, it did have to write a lot of code. Next question, how much do customers spend on our platform on average? So we're looking for the average spend per user. And let me send you this code. And like what we discussed already, what makes this measure special is it's referencing a measure from a different view. Um, average spend per user is total sales divided by the user count. And since count of users is in a, the users table, you got to reference what view it's coming from or else it won't work. And then the other thing you got to make sure you do, since we're going into the users table, we got to make sure the join exists in the explore. We got to make sure that order items and users have, have join logic already predefined. So if we um, check this out in the Explorer, so we're looking at the average spend per user by city. And since um, the the user the count of users is coming from the users view, it knows it's got to join in the users view, and it and it has a left join to the users view already in it. And this um, this measure is is pointing to both the base table order items and the users table users ID account distinctive user ID. Um, this is important to know uh you know this is actually you know account star users that count uh you know it, account is just account star of table but since it's got join logic attached to it it converts the count star into a count distinct of the primary key of the table so they're basically the same thing but one's going to help you out with a fan out problem um because we're joining in uh order items to users users has a lot less rows in order items but as soon as we join them together now they have the same amount of rows so the way to get the count star of users id you would convert the count star into a count distinct we're going to talk about that you know later that's more of a that's a complicated sql problem it's not looker specific it's related to every database uh, the fan out problem and we'll get to that uh, later well, that's all the exercises.
So, so far we have developed a lot of dimensions and measures. And our explorer is starting to look a little overwhelming with so many fields. If an explorer looks too intimidating, business users may feel uncomfortable and unwilling to embrace Looker. That is why designing user-friendly explorers is critical for user adoption. So uh, here there are you know, a few ways in which we can uh, clean up Looker and clean up an explorer. Uh, the first one is apply the hidden parameter. We talked about that earlier, but um, we apply this to fields that we need to use in the back end, but are not meaningful for analytics. Um, so in the user's view, we could hide um, we could hide you know many fields that you know we know we wouldn't use uh, like first name, last name, ID. Uh, Yeah, we'll get to that. Let me show you what, what, what I mean by the hidden parameter. Um, I think profit. Profit, you know, I mentioned before, uh, Looker's gonna create a dimension off of everything, but sometimes the dimension is not needed for the explorer. For instance, any uh, measure, it's gonna, you're gonna see it as a dimension and you need to keep it as a dimension in LookML, but since you're never gonna use it in the Explorer, you can hide it. So you just apply the hidden equals yes. And we're expressing profit as a measure, as total profit. And that's that's the number one scenario for why you'd use profit. You could also use average profit. You could do other measures off profit, but you're always gonna wanna aggregate profit. Profit's never a value as a dimension. So that's why the hidden, is important so you know we're referencing profit right here uh in total profit we're, we're pointing to profit so it's being used in the back end but um with the hidden parameter you're not going to see profit uh as a dimension right here um it, it doesn't it doesn't it, it it doesn't have any value as a dimension so it's worth hiding Uh, the second uh, thing you can do is you can use the label parameter to change the display of a field name in the Explorer. So maybe uh, created doesn't really make sense to the business, so we could label it as registered. Uh, remember, Looker will automatically append the word date to the dimension group name or label. Also, Looker only capitalizes the first letter of the field name and the first letter following any underscore. So uh, a good example is ZIP, Z-I-P. It's an abbreviation where the I and the P should also be capitalized. So we can make that happen through a label. Let me show you. So I highlight this out, but... Uh, for, for the dimension group created within the order items view, uh, we can change created to register. So I can add a, a label to it called register, and that's gonna turn it from created date, created week, to registered date, registered week. So it's still gonna apply the append that happens with dimension groups, but now instead of being created, it's gonna show up as registered. So when I go in the order items, because we changed the label of that dimension group, we now see registered date. The other example is for zip code. ZIP. If you don't do anything, it's going to show up as capital Z, lowercase IP. That doesn't... Um, makes sense because it's an abbreviation. You'd want to label it as all caps. So all caps ZIP. Um, let me show you what it looks like without cleaning it. You know, Looker takes all the code that you write, you know, you see traffic source, traffic underscore source, and it turns it into Where's traffic source? Oh, I'm in the user's view. 
So, you know, traffic source, we labeled it traffic underscore source. You keep everything lowercase. What Looker is going to automatically do is going to capitalize the first letter and then turn underscores into spaces. And that's what it does for everything. Um, for zip, zip center has a, um, you see zip right now is capital Z underscore IP. Uh, it should be all caps. So you can clean that up with the label statement. Small nuance, but um, you know you can you you don't you can you can change the the label of anything. So now when I go into zip, now it's all capitals, capital ZIP. So that's the label statement. Uh, the next one is group label. Uh, the field, this field picker sorts all dimensions out. Uh, uh, all right, as default. The field picker sorts all dimensions af alphabetically, and then all the measures. When we have multiple dimensions that are closely related in concept but dispersed across the alphabet, we can use a group label to bundle them together like a dimension group. Except it won't technically become a dimension group. It will just look like one to the business user. For example, we can apply group label address info to city, city-state, country, and zip. So let me show you. This is a really cool technique. So with a bunch of dimensions, um, all related to address, I created a group label called address info. And I applied it to numerous fields, like latitude, longitude, state. So they all have this group label of address info. And all that does is create this dropdown called address info. So this group label made it made a group called address info, and it just grouped in all the address info together as one. Otherwise, you know, these four fields would show up just like these fields. But uh, this is a nice way to group fields into 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 groups using the group label parameter. The description parameter produces a tooltip that can help give users more context about a particular field. Let's add one to traffic source so people will know this is a referral site or application to our platform. The neat thing about descriptions is that when users search the field picker for a word in the description, such as refer, the traffic source field will show up in the search results. The search is extremely helpful and explores with multiple views, so it can be tedious for users to expand every view and scan the list of fields in each and find a specific field. Let me show you the description field. So if you look at traffic source, I added is the description that says referral site or application to our platform. And I'll show you how that manifests in the explore. So if I click on this information icon, the description shows up right here, referral site or application to our platform. So this is very valuable just to give uh, a better user experience um, for your final explorers. We have already seen how value format name renders output in a user-friendly way. If you know spreadsheet style formatting, you can also use the value format. So I showed you that um, in an earlier um, example I, f I forget the which one it was but um you know value format name and value format they do the same thing but two different ways the drill fields parameter allows you to configure fields to display when a user drills down on a value at the start of this training you saw how i clicked the, uh, never mind you didn't see that so uh drill fields let's talk about drill fields
Um, I, I believe uh, you already have this in your uh, explore or in your LookML, but um, you know, Looker automatically creates drill fields for you, um, and this is useful for um, you know drilling into uh, a value. Let me show you what I mean. Yeah, so a drill field is the ability to uh you know what when you want to drill into a specific value what do you want to see in that drill so in this definition i just find the drill fields as six fields so if you drill in, in into any metric in this view i want you to give me a table that shows these six fields so when i drilled into um user spend average spend by user what it's doing is it's filtering on uh this city state and it's giving me the a table that i defined right here in drill fields so that's a pretty cool functionality uh about looker i think i want to show one more thing Okay, I applied a drill field to the dimension state. Let's show you what that looks like. So let's plug in. So this behaves a little different. So um, in our first example, I applied drill field at the at the view level. So in order items. I didn't. I defined this drill uh, parameter not to a specific measure or dimension, but to the view, it, the whole view itself. So it's going to work on every measure uh, in the in the view. And and then I got this drill field function that tells you to 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 call on detail, which is right here. Um, but we can also um, apply drill fields. Um, at the individual dimension level um, so for country let's add both country and city state so i applied a drill field to country which is state and city and i applied one to state which is just city if i were to click on a state value it's going to give me the option to drill just by city and I can do that, and it's going to uh, pull up a new exp uh, view. And now it's showing um, the the explore value, the, the tables that you can see, but now just by city. Now, if I click on country, I have the option to drill either by state or by city, and that's because I gave it two two values, state and city, so I can go into all the states in the United K. This is gonna give me, um, these are all the states in the UK and then this is average spend. So those are the two applications of drill fields. All right, nine more minutes. Okay, we've done a lot of great stuff in views, but ultimately our efforts are meaningless if we don't expose them to the business users through explorers. To work with explorers, we will nav need to navigate to the model file. Explorers, as we've discussed, can be considered a set of tables with predefined join logic. We define explorers similarly to how we define dimensions and measures by entering the word explore followed by a colon and giving it a name. Unlike dimensions and measures, 
the name here shouldn't be one you make up. It needs to be the name of the actual view. The explore name establishes the base view, meaning the view that is driving the analysis for the explore. Other views joined to the, this explore provide additional or supplemental analysis. So let me reiterate that. So when I go to this explore, it talks about a root view, the one that is driving the analysis, and that's order items. That's the first view in the explore. That's the root view. And then all the other ones, all the other tables that we're joining in, those are called additional or supplemental views. The big thing you need to know is that this base view is always going to, you know, this is always going to be the from clause, the, the from table, always, even if none of the the view the dimensions and measures and order items are being used, it's always going to join in this table because it's the root table. The types of joins available are left outer, inner, full outer, and cross. Some good diagrams here. There are some good diagrams to dis dis distinguish these types. Um, right joins are not supported because not all dialects support them. If you really need to do a right join, you just got to flip it to a left join. In the SQL on parameter, enter what the two views should be joined on. Typically, it would be a dimension from one view equals a dimension from the other view. But same as when you are writing any regular SQL query, you could join on multiple dimensions, perform an inequality join, and much more. The relationship describes the cardinality between the two views. If the data is many to one, one to one, many to many, etc. Um, the relationship parameter is the trickiest parameter to get tr correct, and it's very important. If you don't get it right, right, um, the metrics will not calculate correctly. So you must know um, the relationship between your data. Um, for our example and for most examples of data, uh, it's many to one star schema. Again, the name of the explorer is the base view. It is always in the from clause of any SQL query generated in the explore. In this example above, the joins to carrier and aircraft are both considered standard as each one joins directly to the base view of flights in the SQL on parameter. So sorry, this is not the same example that we've been working with, but in this example, we got the flights as the base view and then we're joining in um, two tables, carrier and aircraft. Sometimes we need to join the same table twice in one SQL query. How would you do that in the world of manually writing SQL queries? You would alias the two tables differently. That's what the joins to aircraft origin and aircraft destination are doing. The flights table in this data set has one column called origin, which points to an airport code and another column called destination, which also points to an airport code. The airports table then is the lookup table containing all the details about each airport code, such as full name, city, and state. If you try to write a join to airports twice in the Flights Explorer, Looker will throw an error on the second one saying you already have a join on airports. This makes sense because if you were trying to write a SQL query joining to airports twice, your database would complain about the same thing. So pr to produce different aliases, you would need to give the join whatever name makes sense and then add a from parameter pointing to the real view name airports. So in this example, you see the airports table is being joined twice. And the way you do this in Looker is in the join, you give it its alias name, so it's gotta be different for every joined value. So in joining airports twice, the first one is airports origin and the second one is aircraft, aircraft destination. And it's the same table that's being joined in though. 
And that's very, um, you know, for any date table, you're gonna, you're certainly gonna do that too. So this is a very common use case, how to join the same table twice. We could also write indirect joins, which join, don't join to the base view, but to another view in the Explorer. In this example, aircraft, aircraft flights facts does not join back to the base view of flights. It joins to aircraft, which is the second join or the third view in this Explorer. I call this daisy chaining of joins. Anytime a business user has an inquiry involving aircraft flights facts, the generated SQL must select from flights and join to aircraft, even if no fields or, filtered are, or filters are needed from aircraft itself in order to join to aircraft flight flax. So you have, so you have an extra join in there which can affect performance. If there is no way to join flights directly to aircraft flights, that's fine. That's just how the data is structured. But if there is a join key you could use from the base view directly, the best practice would be to use that and avoid an indirect join. So this fourth, this bottom example is called an indirect join. You're not joining via the base table flights. You're joining, you're daisy chaining. You're, you're joining from the, aircraft table, which is right here. Yeah, this one. So from the join is from, uh, you know, two, not, none of the base tables. That's what you call an indirect join. All right, we are, our time is up. It is 2.49, so um, we can call it a day and we will reconvene tomorrow. But I hope this has been, uh, useful for you guys i hope you guys feel like you are learning looker um it's a really cool tool thanks danny this certainly was very helpful great thank you well i will see you guys um tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning sure. for two All hours right. yep thank you thank you everyone for joining see you tomorrow bye bye Bye. Thank you. See ya. Great job, Danny. Thanks, Jake. Thanks. Thank you.